Good morning. Welcome, thank you all for being here. It is a pleasure to have you here. We opened our new season of exhibitions uh, last night and here we are this morning beginning our um, programming and looking deeper into the works on view. I'm Lisa Melandry, I'm the executive director here at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, and I thought I might start by way of introduction um, talking a little bit about our building and the spaces herein and the way that we have sought to use them and then introduce you to this collaborative group of wonderful architects to my left. Um, Several years ago, we started thinking very much about the exterior spaces at the museum, about ways that we could um, have different scales of interventions or change to make the spaces dynamic on the outside as well as the inside. And the courtyard was kind of our last frontier. We began with rethinking the facade and the exterior that you would, you know, how you would approach the museum from Washington Ave and from Spring Street and how we could kind of make you recognize that we were here and how we could do that with art and commissioned work by artists. And about, I guess it was maybe three years ago that we also, um, at the same time, were thinking very seriously about what to do, um, not only with the courtyard, but with the kind of cantilevered space that you have under the entrance. And at that time, that was three years ago, right? It yeah, it was a while, okay. So at that time, um, we actually worked with Jason and with Lavender and their students at the time at WashU to come up with a project that could change the way that you enter, the, the way that you perceived entering the building. And because it was an intervention under that cantilever, it was in many ways a surprise. It was something that revealed itself first and foremost through the shadows that it cast, through the way that light changed as you approached, and that um, it was a kind of not until you were right there underneath did you look up and begin to see the kind of material and sculptural quality of that piece at the time, which was called the Cumulus. And I will say that that was a really, really, really successful project because it really did change the way that you thought about the space. Concurrently, we started thinking about this courtyard of ours. And our courtyard is a gorgeous space, but it's a little brute, you know, it's a little gray and concrete and gravelly and all of those things. And so we were thinking about what makes you appreciate the light and the air and the weather while perhaps being more welcoming, wanting you to spend more time there. And after several iterations of different kinds of things, here we are with Hedge, and we are so delighted and grateful. So at this point, I will introduce the three collaborators who have brought Hedge to life here, and then they're gonna kind of take you through their practice, and then we can uh, open it up to questions. So Jason Foster Butts, Nathaniel Eberfeld, and Lavender Tesmer. Um, are graduates and lecturers in the Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Design at Washington University, St. Louis. They have taught seminars and studios in parametric design, digital fabrication, and digital representation, and they share research interests where digital specificity and analog handcraft intersect, and that's something that we're really going to talk about, this balance between kind of the, the, the technological, the digital, and the truly analog, the handmade, the handcrafted. Prior to this collaboration, um, the three have practiced in offices both in St. Louis and in New York City, and they've designed a wide range of projects from site-specific installations to high-end residential and commercial projects around the world. And I think one of the kind of places to start from um, for us is this idea of architectural installation, architectural design, when architecture becomes something that is a hybrid piece of art that lives as um, a kind of changeable, transformative installation in the museum space. And with that, they're gonna take you through their practice. And we have this incredible um, soundtrack Mm -hmm. of the Micheline Thomas exhibition behind us. So if you at any point can't hear us, please let us know and we will speak up. 
So with that, please take us through. Absolutely, it'll make it more interesting. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think that was a great introduction to kind of uh, the way that we all uh, kind of think about uh, architecture and its relation to art. Um, I think something that we have in common is trying to find uh, commonalities and, and boundaries that exist and how to kind of um, to bridge uh, these two things together. And so we've done that mostly thus far in the context of uh, studios and classes at Washington University. Um, so to run through a few of those projects that we've done over the years, um, the first one here is Acumos. This is the one that Lisa described. It was um, back in the spring of 2015. Um, so this was a installation that was done in this cantilevered space here. This is a group of 12 students that we worked with. Um, this project is uh, PETG plastic and steel wire. So um, we're very interested in kind of uh, translating two-dimensional grids into something volumetric and exploring how um, those systems fill space. And so this was the first sort of test of that system. Um, the following year, in the spring of 2016, um, we did a series of three smaller experimental projects that were on campus. Um, so this one, suspended in resin, um, this is in the kind of stairwell of the Steinberg Gallery, if you've ever um, been there. Um, it's still up today. Um, the next one was uh, a smaller installation that was more focused on the detail scale. Um, it's called Observatory. And we'll talk again more of details of these projects. And the third one was in the cafe very briefly, um, uh, Invasion. Um, and this was uh, made entirely out of sheet wood. Um, and then last year we worked with um, the uh, Lambert St. Louis Airport in Terminal 2, their southwest terminal, and um, with a group of eight students designed and built Spectroplexus. Um, it's up now. If you fly through Southwest, you should check it out. Um, and this, all of these studios have sort of been backed up by uh, the previous five years of research um, that we did sort of together and independently through a series of seminars at WashU. Um, these are some of those courses, and so it was kind of trying to build a foundation with students, a body of knowledge um, that they could come into these studios uh, knowing kind of how to approach these topics. Um, and then we'll talk obviously in more detail about Hedge, but this is all sort of leading up to the premise of this project. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about our process. Um, there's sort of six areas that we uh, focus on. Uh, craft, um, so kind of re-injecting craft into the process. Um, precision versus variation, so uh, kind of dealing with translating between the computer and a, a physical form. Uh, social assembly, so these projects are lots of small pieces. We need lots of hands on deck, and so the kind of social atmosphere that's created by, by doing this type of work. Uh, grids and geometry, they're all kind of based on some kind of structural grid. Uh, Script-based variation, we use a uh, scripting software called Grasshopper uh, to generate these projects. Um, so it's a parametric-based software that allows you to deal with multiple components at the same time. And then the influence from nature, so we're always looking to nature for inspiration. Um, so the first one, craft. Um, so what we'll do, um, we're going to talk a little bit about these kind of different categories of interests we have um, in our body of work um, in the first half, and then kind of in the second half of our lecture, we're going to go into a lot more detail about Hedge, um, and we're going to kind of walk through the design and fabrication process um, of this project. Um, but first, we'll give it a little bit of context um, through our past work. Um, and so this first category of craft, um, in my opinion, might be kind of the most important aspect of our body of work. Um, and so what we attempt to do um, is, even though we develop our projects digitally, um, so they're kind of start to finish digitally modeled and scripted, um, but all of them in some way seek to um, invent a craft technique that's specific to that project. Um, and so here um, you can kind of see um, molds that we produced that were digitally fabricated, um, but then there was a very um, kind of craft-intensive way of working with them in the project. Um, 
And that was similar to the Spectroplexus project at the airport uh, where we used um, digitally fabricated modules, but um, kind of the method of wrapping them, um, kind of wrapping carbon fiber onto them um, was a very kind of unique and specific um, manual method of using the material kind of developed alongside the digital process. Um, and uh, likewise with the actual assembly of all of these pieces, um, there's a, kind of a uh, knowledge that is built into the process that has to be learned on site. So as we're assembling these, you can see here some drawings that are uh, sort of our construction documents um, that you, you know, the students have to sort of learn the process and then build on it as they go. Um, and I think craft is important for us uh, a lot because it's a reaction to the sort of state of the architecture industry currently where um, you know skilled craftsmen or it's uh, kind of a, a dying industry and um, I think in a lot of um, work that you see that's digitally produced there's this kind of desire to go straight from what you see in the computer to what's built so it's a very one-to-one -one relationship where we want to kind of open it up and allow room um, for the hand process to sort of inform that a little more. And we like to say that it produces something that's very savage in nature. There's like a messiness to it. Um, and that brings us to the next topic, um, which is in our projects kind of a contrast between precision and variation. Um, so it's a contrast between the digital model, which is extremely precise, and then the manual methods that are used to produce those geometries. Um, so, for instance, um, this project, um, here is, here's the mold um, that we use to produce um, kind of re resin-soaked plastic modules. Um, and they had kind of a range of different pigments, um, and the way that the pigment was distributed across the modules in the system, um, it had um, kind of subjectivity to it. Um, so the way that you kind of see the, see the pigments and arrange them, um, that was digitally modeled, but it has um, kind of extra variation that comes from kind of decision-based, kind of decisions that you make while you're making something. Um, and so that kind of increases um, the amount of variation in the projects. Um, if you go back one. one more. So what you're seeing here on the right is the mold that was produced to make the piece on the left. So on the right here, this is what was designed in the computer. So they're using, the students use um, all different fabrication methods. So they're, they're using a CNC mill to build this wooden base. Um, then they're laser cutting um, plastic that then is wrapped around it. So they're, they're building these things in the computer that are three-dimensional. They're then flattened to fabricate, built. And then the handcraft comes in um, with the unpredictability of wrapping it, right? Um, sometimes the string doesn't always stay in the groove. Sometimes you put on, you apply too much resin and so it, you have these areas that get thick and sometimes there's not enough resin and so they break apart. Um, so I think what the end result is is something that um, seeks to kind of uh, expose the underlying grid and the underlying craft that's built in, but it's, there's never meant to be um, this kind of one-to-one -one relationship. And then there are some projects um, that have explored how this works at a much more precise scale. So this project in particular, um, they used 3D printing um, and mold making to try to build these elements that, I mean, this is down, the tolerance of this piece was to the millimeters um, to kind of get these pieces to connect properly. Um, so they're always, we're always asking um, the work to kind of find a balance between a precision and a, this hand quality. Um, and then there's also this constant struggle between what you see on the screen and this kind of perfect, the perfect nature of that, and then what that produces in real life. And again, this is that sort of savage quality that we're um, always looking for. Um, I guess another example of the same topic um, in the Spectroplexus project um, had to do with the way the, um, the ink was applied to the surfaces. Um, so the surfaces, again, um, they were kind of CNC cut 
um, on a machine. Um, so they have kind of an exact geometry that's generated from the computer, but then um, the way that the pigment is applied to the surface um, is totally random. Um, and then in the end, um, you can see kind of evidence of the process of working with the material, both with machine and by hand. And you can see yeah. there a similar process where on the left here, the, the wooden mold that was made, this is what was outputted in the computer. And then there's a wrapping process and a curing process to create the carbon fiber mold. Um, and then the surface inserted. Uh, this project being the one that happened uh, most recently since Hedge had informed a lot of what we did here. So working, it was the first time that they were, or that we were exploring uh, carbon fiber. Um, so we learned a lot from this project that informed what happened here. Um, there's also this aspect of uh, what we call social assembly that comes out of these projects. So, um, you know, these are students, architecture students are very used to spending long hours in the studio. Um, and so we wanted to create um, a sort of process that allows them to unify around a particular craft. And it, I think it builds um, a sort of camaraderie um, throughout the process that everyone is learning how to do the same thing. Everyone's new to that process. Everyone developed it together. Um, and, you know, we ask them to recruit their friends to help. And it's, we always ask them to, to design a process that's simple enough that, it can, that anyone can learn it. On a few of our projects, we had people that were inviting their, you know, uh, friends from church and their nieces and 13-year-old nieces and nephews. And, you know, we want, we ask um, the projects to kind of be simple enough that anyone can engage in it. Um, and this is, again, Spectroplex is the latest. Um, how that worked there. Um, so another really important way um, that we kind of try to develop the craft system, so craft and materiality, is through geometry. Um, so we begin a lot of our projects by working from um, a kind of basic volumetric grid. Um, so with the students, we do explorations of um, three-dimensional grid types um, and from that, we develop kind of module geometries. Um, so we do a lot of kind of geometric exploration in our process. Um, and then um, through kind of models, like building models and building kind of physical studies, um, we materialize the geometry kind of in the next step. So these are some study models from the Spectroplexus project. Um, and in some ways, they resemble the final installation, and in some ways, they don't. Um, but in each project, um, there was really important kind of moments where the geometry took on um, a material quality um, rather than kind of just an abstract grid. Um, and then finally, in our work, um, kind of the next stage um, is making the making the geometry site specific. Um, so here, which is an image from a cumulus. Um, in the entryway here, uh, we adapted kind of a system of the kind of volumetric grid um, directly into the boundary of the site. Um, so digitally, um, that's the part that has a lot of precision. Um, so we controlled kind of the exact dimension and volume um, that the project fills um, to the site. Um, and here's just another example of a grid that adapted to um, an existing kind of an existing set of columns in a space, so the, the geometry we put in the site was able to kind of adapt and work around the existing structure in the building. Um, um, so again, we're using a software that's called Grasshopper. Um, it is uh, an open source plugin for another software called Rhino. For some reason, architects like to name their software after animals. I couldn't tell you why. Um, but so we're, we're using this software. It allows you to kind of deal with multiple discrete elements individually and then populate into a larger system. Um, it basically saves a lot of time in working with these kind of tiny elements all at once. Um, and so we're always looking for how that software can produce variation within the system. Um, so here, you know, kind of basing it off of the same geometry, but, but allowing it, the geometry to change across the system. Um, 
So with the next slide, you can see um, this, this is the final set of parts for a cumulus. So it kind of, from one end, uh, this geometry kind of started to grow these tails. So at one side, it maintained this rigidity, and then it allowed the system to kind of grow and become sort of floppy over the door, um, very leaf-like in the same way that hedges. Um, and in the project at the airport, um, the variables consisted of color and shape of the panels that we used. Um, so here's an image that shows kind of variation across the system of parts that were colored and cut by the machinery. These are images from a seminar that I taught last fall called Digital Evolutions. The students started um, looking at the work of Ernst Haeckel, who is a 19th century sort of polymath who um, uh, documented natural uh, radial era and other microscopic and macroscopic um, uh, creatures in nature. And, and it was sort of in the era of ta uh, not taxidermy, but taxonomy. Um, and, and so the students uh, looked to, to some of his drawings, which are fantastic, and they 3D modeled um, they 3D modeled these um, um, sort of as close to the original image as they could, but then, um, then they took the 3D model and they parametricized it through this program Grasshopper that we've mentioned, and then um, allowed their, these sort of fictitious entities to evolve uh, g given in, in, in imagined um, environmental conditions. So the, I, I called them sort of fabricated fabrications. These, um, um, and so, and so, uh, to speak to the variety, the, vari the variety came in the form of understanding it as as evolutions and and uh, sort of this iterative uh, design process, which which uh, I think is important to the to the way we work. And I think um, that brings us to kind of the last category, which which gets closer um, to presenting about kind of the hedge project um, behind us, which is that there's kind of a lot of influence from nature. Um, in our work and in the way that we use geometry. So. Okay. Um, so these are some um, kind of more 3D printed objects from students who were kind of studying natural forms um, in one way or another. Um, so these images are from Jason's course um, and these are from mine. Um, and then these are some of the 3D printed objects from Nathaniel's course um, that are studying kind of Hegel's work um, and developing it into kind of a new kind of geometric system. Okay, so that brings us to Hedge, um, so which is kind of the current project um, in the courtyard. Um, and we're going to kind of using the rest of our work as a context, uh, we're going to kind of speak about our design process in this um, and how it's made. So it sort yeah. of started when we, um, uh, so when we did a cumulus, we were working with a company called Poly One Plastic, and um, you know the plastic that we used for that project was was very specific to that process. So um, we kind of had to use that specific type. Um, they were always sort of contacting us with uh, waste that they had. Um, they do a lot of experimental um, compounds, and so they can't always recycle them, unfortunately. Um, and so we kind of found this stream, that w a waste stream, that was not really being utilized, and we thought that was interesting to, as opposed to finding a material that suited the, the system, to build a system around um, being able to use any material. Um, and then, like Lisa mentioned, we were very compelled by um, the kind of um, explorations that she's brought into this, this space and how to kind of make this space uh, more green, um, and, and how do you interpret that um, kind of notion of, of what makes a space green? You know, um, as architects, I think that we see the concrete and the gravel, and it's very beautiful to us, and it's a it's a blank slate. And so, um, in the same way that Acumos was, I think that we really reacted to kind of this blank palette, and then also again, always looking to nature, um, the environment that's already out there. Um, and creating sort of a, a canopy of light and shade um, in, an, in a more artificial way. Um, so we started looking at green walls 
um, for inspiration and, and hedges and, and um, plantings that kind of grow naturally on an environment. And the reaction to the space, space initially was to kind of respect those hard edges. Um, so, and that's why you'll see here that it's kind of placed in, in that kind of open space um, above um, that concrete wall. And so this was sort of just the first conceptual rendering of that. And so the project started with just contemplating um, what, what does green mean in the context of uh, recycling material rather than plantings. So, and so I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the process of using the repur repurposed material. Um, and so that's really kind of the origin of how we went about designing this project. Um, and the thing about using either recycled or repurposed items um, is that they can be really unpredictable. Um, so normally when you buy new material, you can predict its size and its thickness and the way the material will behave, um, and it's very reliable. Um, but when you're attempting to use a source of material that um, isn't newly manufactured, um, it can lead to a lot of variables that make it really difficult to use the material um, in a project. Um, and so in this case, uh, we, uh, we started with these kind of very large rolls of plastic, um, and they were all different sizes. Um, they had totally different behaviors. Um, and in a lot of ways, there was kind of an unpredictable nature um, to using them. Um, and so the way, the way that we worked with this material, um, we attempted to use script and the digital modeling process that we've used in other projects, um, specifically to address the idea of how to use the computer um, to accommodate this kind of variety of materials that have unknown qualities. Um, and so that was kind of the origin of this project. So we got these rolls and we kind of cut them down into usable segments. Um, and the way that we set up the, the script in our project, um, it had kind of variability that deals with the dimension and proportion of the material. Um, we had variability that deals with um, the size of parts, the size and proportion of parts that can be cut out of it. Um, and then finally, we had kind of variation of the type of kind of detail. Um, and kind of the constraint to all of this was that um, because we wanted to reduce material waste as much as possible, um, all of those things can seamlessly tile um, a sheet of plastic. Um, so the shapes that you see on hedge, um, they're totally constrained by um, things that leave no gaps on a sheet. Um, so a lot, of a lot of people will yeah. ask when we were installing, uh, you know, what are the plants you're referencing or what are, what are the shape, where are the shapes coming from? So uh, as uh, Lavender mentioned, they're all they're all designed, and I think this is the best image to show. This, they all, they're all designed to, to fit the whole sheet, and 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 yet they have a certain characteristic that's not really natural, but it's natural-ish, it's natural-esque, um, and so it cumulatively it gives you that it gives you the behavior we were looking for, but it does so in a way that is able to use the most resources, it, which in an own way is a sort of natural behavior, right? N nature is sort of the most efficient machine. And so this is our way of not, not um, referencing nature kind of symbolically or directly, but actually um, sort of through an innate logic and then through an experience. And then the video clip that's playing now, um, it's an image of what we kind of see on the screen when we're working with the script that we've made. Um, so it gives us um, a direct way of kind of experimenting with the variables that we've built into it. Um, so this is how all of those shapes were generated. Um, so we had a script that was able to generate kind of an infinite range of variations. Um, and then from that, uh, we chose a final set of 15. Um, so hedge is composed of 15 distinct parts, um, and all of them kind of satisfy that constraint that they must kind of tile a sheet seamlessly. Um, okay. Um, so the second kind of the second really big kind of aspect of this project is the development of the carbon fiber net that all of the pieces are attached to. Um, and we had a couple of impl important influences. Um, one, again, was um, nature. Um, so we wanted kind of a vine-like armature on which the plastic could hang. Um, and then we were also looking at craft. 
Um, so the, the craft technique that we kind of reference the most was um, this bobbin lace making. Um, and so it consists of using a pattern with kind of thread and pins um, and material, kind of linear material that's loaded onto bobbins um, and then kind of worked, worked together in a pattern. Um, so this shows kind of an initial pattern um, and then on top of it um, using kind of material with pins. Um, so we, kind of, we took this technique um, and we used it as a method of working with the carbon fiber. Um, and the thing about carbon fiber is that um, it's the strongest when it's kind of intertwined with itself um, as many times as possible. So this, um, it was a really appropriate technique to make something that was really strong in the end. Um, so here are some kind of initial studies of the geometry that we're going to use. Um, and these have a, digital, a digitally produced pattern, um, but then a kind of manually produced um, kind of method um, on top of the pattern. Um, and then these are the bobbins that we made for the project. Um, so we had hundreds of bobbins and they were all kind of loaded with carbon fiber. Um, and they were color coded um, that gave us kind of a really straightforward way to work the material um, in the pattern. Um, and so here on the left is a study and you can kind of see printed under it um, a digitally generated pattern. Um, and then on the right is an image of kind of the final um, plywood kind of backing that we used, uh, which was also um, produced from a digitally generated printout. Um, and then here we are kind of working with the bobbins and the fiber um, on these panels. So there's six types of panels. Um, we finished each panel, um, there's 30 in total. Um, and then when the panel is woven, um, it's put into an oven. Um, and so the material cures and becomes rigid um, after it's baked for an hour and a half. Um, so when you're working with the fiber, it's kind of loose, just like string. And after it's baked, it becomes, um, it becomes very rigid and structural. Um, so in the end, this produced um, a really delicate but very rigid um, kind of set of panels. So this is the kind of armature um, with all the panels assembled. Um, and so finally, kind of the last stage of this project um, is thinking about the pattern in which the 15 different types of plastic um, are attached onto the net. Um, and back to green walls and plantings, um, we are thinking of this like a planting diagram, but at the same time, um, kind of like making a, a hook rug um, that has kind of a mesh or a net um, and kind of a color-coded pattern. Um, and then we are also thinking about just sort of color by number instructions um, for how to build or how to construct the order of material. Um, and then we also had some site-specific ideas um, about how the material should be distributed. So one of my favorite projects is by uh, Le Corbusier, who's a, a sort of the, the architect of the 20th century. This is a project he did for, and my French is non-existent, but Ch Charles de Bistegui. Uh, in around 1930, and it's this. This is a rooftop garden. This sort of eccentric um, um, aristocrat. Um, but what's very interesting in this project is the way the high walls create a room outside, and uh, at once remove you from the context of the city because your view is blocked, and yet. Uh, selectively reinforces your connection with the icons of Paris so that only the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower are peeking out over the wall. And I, we noticed that this is the exact condition in this courtyard where the high walls of the Ondo and the Cam building are uh, sort of redacting the skyline and you're left with the Masonic Temple, the tower, and a couple other buildings. Um, so uh, this was our way of having, it was really important to us to have um, a, a site specificity, not just a, that, that this is not just a formal exercise, but I think, and I think and it's also a way that it becomes like architecture, whatever that means anymore, um, that we are interested still in site, we are interested in place. And so there's this idea of like, I've been thinking of this idea of like the deep site and, you know, instead of the deep state. Um, so that, that it might rhyme with this Corbusier project or that it's honestly probably not even perceptible to most people, but that it's somehow there 
is important. And so in the end, it's a combination of kind of the image from the site that's being imprinted on the, the pattern, um, but then it's also um, the pieces that are kind of algorithmically arranged based on characteristics of the net that they're attached to, maybe. So in, in yeah. places where you see that the net pinches down, right? Um, some of the plastic is more brittle, and if you bend in a certain way, it will break. Some of it is um, uh, more paper-like, and so it can fit into smaller places. So then at the same time that we're kind of contextualizing, we're letting the material tell us what it wants to do. And then this is one of our construction documents, uh, which kind of has a diagram of the net with a kind of very simple and diagrammatic indication of what type of shape goes in which place. Um, so this is this is kind of most similar to a color by number diagram, um, where it takes the 15 shapes and produces documents that tell you kind of where each shape is meant to be assembled. Um, and so here is the assembly process. Um, and so we have kind of some students who are helping us, and they're of working with the printed documents or the printed diagrams um, to assemble the kind of array of pieces onto the net. Um, it also allows, yeah. if you go back to the assembly diagram, it also allows uh, this idea of to get a, a sort of slippage in, in the assembly so that you know there's there's many opportunities along the way where the whole process is under a certain kind of control but you know i obviously do not care if piece 13 is right there it could be a little bit north or south of that so students had the freedom to um, not interpret it completely freely but it's not supposed to be hyper legible it's a different kind of legibility that allows for that allows for something more complex to emerge We'll close with um, just a short video, um, and it was taken by Alex here at the CAM. Um, open this up, and so this just very quickly shows our installation process where um, all, the p all the panels um, were interconnected and then kind of lifted up to the beam. And this is playing on loop near the restrooms if you want to. Yeah. I'll just start, and then certainly we can open it up <coughs> to questions from the audience. But there are two things I just am interested in having you talk about. Um, one is once something like this goes up in a space, there's a certain amount of letting go that you have to practice in terms of what is going to act upon these things. So you can do the best planning that you can do in terms of what happens in a rainstorm or a windstorm or you know, what is the engineering behind it? But there is a certain amount of transformation um, that could be beautiful, that could be bad, that could be dirtying, um, that happens. And I think one of the things that was very interesting for us is that we didn't really know what was going to happen to a cumulus, for example. And I think we were very, very surprised by how little the actual materials changed in any way during the course of that time. But that was also a project where you were choosing the material. So now you're working with what you call, you know, unreliable material because it's not something you're, you know, getting new, it's not something that you understand. What what do you think is going to happen to this? Or what are the possibilities and what does that mean for the piece? Well, I think actually it's it's relevant to the uh, conceptual framework of this being plant-like, right? Um, so we, we thought of each of these plastics as uh, species in a way, and they all have their own properties and they're all going to age differently. Um, we did leave some of it out in the sun to see what would happen, but you know, we only had a certain amount of time. So in a way, we're, we're kind of along for the ride. <laughs> um, but yeah, letting go, um, that's something that, you know, it's a continual. I think an exciting possibility is that, is that this piece will have its own autumn because the, the, mm -hmm. um, 
plastic will degrade and yellow, especially mm -hmm. given it's really harsh lighting. It's just being blasted by sun always. Um, and so actually we're hoping that it, it kind of takes on a yellow quality and, you know, I think even a few pieces could break off and mm -hmm. it would be okay. We might have to talk about the logistics <laughs> of cleaning that up. If I could j just one story about Accumulus. Um, we were just talking the other day about, you know, about I think it was like three or four days after it was up, there was awful thunderstorm. Right. And I don't think either of us slept that night thinking, you know, what, <laughs> what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, it was surprising to come back and nothing was touched. So, um, you know, this is a lot more exposed. Yeah. So. Well, and, and I would say we've had experience here. We did two kind of major plant-based, mm -hmm. actual plant-based projects in the courtyard. And they were totally and completely you know unknowns in terms of what would happen and in some cases that was perfectly fine in others we had you know I'm looking at Jesse who's our <laughs> registrar you know with one of them in a windstorm it really totally changed the nature so we also understand that we are dealing with all of those things that one can't control and you know sort of look forward to seeing how that shifts the thing that I also think is really just important to mention as you look at this um, time-lapse video over you know a week's time is you see how when you talk about this being exposed you see the extraordinary shadow play and differentiation that happens here and this is an exhibition that's going to be up for three months so it will have autumn and it will have winter and for us one of the most wonderful things I think about a project like this is becoming more aware of where we're sited, where we're situated, what happens to the path of the sun over the seasons. And, and I think something like this not only makes us more aware of the city and this idea of what is peaking up and around, but also makes us more aware of the light conditions and the way that time quite literally and visually travels through the courtyard. Um, the other thing is you said, um, just towards the end, you know, architecture, whatever that means. And I'm really interested in that, this idea that as architects, you are certainly all um, engaged in a practice that we think of as more practical, right? That has to do with buildings and use. And this is a kind of genre of work that all of you have engaged in and been very, very committed to that is about you know, art, art making, it is about craft, it is about installation, it is about intervention. And I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about that sort of um, hybrid practice. I just, I, I'd say that the practical aspects of architecture are, a, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition uh, for what I would argue is actually architecture because I think, I think the, the things that we're mentioning not exclusively, but um, these ideas about place and space and materials and the thing you feel when you walk in a good space. I think that's what we're trying to do and um, in architecture in general. And so that's why I think that a practice like this or a piece like this can be architecture because it addresses those issues even out, outside of traditional architecture, which is more about walls and ceilings and I mean, certainly there were pla practical aspects about this project, and we even worked with an engineer um, uh, just to kind of double check. Right. Um, we do have to get him that case of beer. Uh, <laughs> we should remember to do that. Um, but, but the practical, I don't know, I think architects get a bad rap in some ways as being sort of technocrats. And a lot of them are, frankly, technocrats. But if you are if you are trying to do, you know, I, I, I guess I like to say I aspire to being an artist um, in the practice, but um, it's not always possible. I also think um, kind of a lot of those um, kind of interests we have um, that, we, that we work through in our projects, um, those apply to buildings. Um, so they result in these projects, um, but they're also questions that we can ask about buildings uh, when we're designing them. Um, so it doesn't always have to be kind of, th the result of our projects doesn't have to visually resemble a building to be asking questions that are relevant to that. Um, so I think that's another, um, another place where art and architecture um, can kind of combine into something. 
I think I'm always interested in things that are non-binary. Uh, and, and why can't art and architecture be one in the same in some ways? Um, I think architecture is less interesting when there is not uh, an artistic approach. And I think that art is, personally for me, less interesting when there is not some kind of embedded process. And so I think that we're trying to find uh, where we can talk about them in the same way rather than uh, sort of segregate them as two separate things. And then the last thing that I would ask before we open it up is going back to the part of your presentation where you were talking about social work, right? This work that is, you're clearly doing a lot of thinking, a lot of planning. You are looking at these shapes. You're doing digital cutouts of things, et cetera. But in every single one of these projects, there's a huge amount of handwork. And when you get to that kind of analog making, you need a lot of hands. Mm -hmm. And what I think is really interesting about these pieces is that um, you know we can look and see all of the planning that goes into them, but how, how many actual kind of cutout shapes do you think are in Hedge, for example? I think there's about 6,000. So, okay, so 6,000 shapes that have to be created and then have to be put onto the armature. So the armature has to be made, then you have all that. So you're talking about a different kind of scale and a real need for hands and for people to do it. But I think that there's also something really interesting about that on a kind of conceptual level, which is, you know, you're like a weaving circle. You're like the knitting circle, right? You become, even though you're dealing with these kind of high tech materials and these, you know, technical processes, you're going back to a model of art and craft making, which is like as old as time immemorial. And that's clearly a choice, but it also means you really, you need you know, this cadre of people who are interested in it. So I was just wondering, you just talk a little bit more about this, you know, attachment to very traditional ways of collectively making things, you know, whether it's a quilt or lace or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think something we all are interested in too is uh, um, uh, making architecture as being something, a process where you actually make something and not just draw something and hand it off to someone else. Um, we found that food and beer are great motivators, so we <laughs> use that as much as we can. Um, but there is, yeah, we, we're asking a lot of the people involved, and, and it, it's a real investment of time and energy, and I think, you know, even as we were kind of talking before, there's, you have the opportunity to kind of uh, make it something that can be cathartic and work through some things with this repetitive um, process, but um, I don't know. I also think in, in my mind, um, one of the things about that that's really important to me um, is that I think that sometimes the technology that we use to develop our projects, um, it can be um, really alienating. Um, it's mm. almost kind right. of the opposite of doing a transferable craft. Um, so it can seem like a really opaque process. Um, and so I think one of my biggest hopes for the, the projects that we do is that it makes, uh, first of all, makes technology accessible um, or seem more accessible. Sorry. Oh, okay. It's not on. Sorry. Oh, it's not on. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, it's not on. Um, so that the crafts we invent can be transferable in a non-architectural sense. Um, so the way that architects translate information about building um, is through um, drawing measured drawings. Um, and then I think that in itself also can, can alienate people um, in the process of making. Whereas craft, um, craft isn't like that at all. And craft is something that you can transfer by speaking or by um, producing a simple diagram. Um, and so those are things that are, um, um, that kind of many more people are fluent in. Um, and so it, um, I would hope that sometime we do a project where um, kind of anybody can make it um, because it takes um, just kind of fluency with some type of craft or familiarity with some type of craft. Um, and so in that way, kind of the more accessible the, pr the construction process is, the more kind of the larger the labor force that's available um, if, it's, if it's not limited. 
we were talking last night about the fact that our student body is very international. Like, mm. like I think more international students than domestic students. Last time I checked, and and that uh, you know there's this sort of American uh, American um, set of skills that like most men would have. I think you know being able to build with two by fours, being able to uh, build like stick frame construction. It's like the things you see on this old house. It's a very American. Uh, it's a very American skill set. It's a very male centric skill set typically, um, and yet our schools. I think probably is it mostly fem female? Do we know? I think it's over fifty percent female and over fifty percent Chinese. So you have a completely different. You have different people who don't necessarily have those skill sets. So that traditional. Um, Design built. This would be called, or your previous studios. So the Accumulus mm -hmm. and uh, the Airport. Uh, those two studios would be co considered what's called a design build studio. So you yeah. design it and you build it. And and previous in previous generations, the design build studio is very two by four centric. Um, oh, that's interesting. And and you'll see there's there's some still on the Del Mar Loop. There's one next to what used to be Public House or something. And then there's one towards the roundabout. Um, and that was sort of the, the golden era of two by fours. And now you don't, your students, you'll have a third year student and they do not know how to make anything out of, out of wood or out of sort of the, you know, the shop. And, um, and so these really open, open craft um, techniques can be learned by anybody. And so it becomes a much more diverse way of making. And it through because it's a craft technique that is specific to what we're building um, it equalizes who has kind of control in the design process um, so it means that kind of everyone in the studio has kind of equal access um, to the technique that we're doing um, and so it doesn't kind of disproportionately give some students um, kind of more power over the design process than others because the process is arrived at by the whole group and kind of invented by the whole group and can be transferred to anyone kind of regardless of their existing skill set. Yeah. Okay, with that, I'd like to open it up if anybody has any questions. Sorry. Oh, is that, that me? Okay, hi. <laughs> um, so, first off, congratulations, it looks awesome. Um, since you're speaking about site specific, what happens to the sculpture after it comes down? And for instance, where's Cumulus now? And also, the um, work at the airport is pretty awesome and amazing. I remember going in there and seeing it and, and saying, hey, those are the people that did Cumulus, right? And Lisa goes, yes. <laughs> so clearly there's like this mark you're leaving that is recognizable as you guys, which is very cool. And so basically that's my question. Oh, last thing. How long is the one in the airport up for? Uh, 18 months. And I think that they are kind of going to see how it goes. Um, it could be longer than that, but 18 It'd be nice if it would stay. Yeah. It looks appropriate for that space. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, that's a, that's a tough question because, um, you know, we, I guess we, we participated in the auction event with Accumulus that unfortunately was not purchased, but, um, you know, we, we tried to kind of give it a second life. Um, we, you know, something that came about in that project in particular is that we, f we realized the whole thing could be broken down back into its sheet state. Um, but I, I think uh, with Hedge specifically, I think um, the idea is that we're, you know, maybe this will get thrown away in the end, but we've interjected in a process where it would have just been thrown away already. And we've, we've this is its second life. This mm -hmm. is its... Uh, yeah. Cycle. Or another way to think of it is we would have had to do this project, we would have had to use other materials. Right. So, so it might return to the landfill, but it meant we didn't use other materials. So in some way it's offsetting it. 
I think there's there's some shortcomings and some potential of what we've done so far. Um, so the shortcomings are that so far we have not been able to repurpose or recite one of our projects. Um, but on the other hand, um, because of the way that they're digitally modeled, um, any one of them could be broken down into its constituent parts and reconfigured. Um, and because of our digital process, um, that would actually be ex very straightforward to revisualize in a new setting. Um, so a cumulus, um, it could have been broken down into p pieces, reconfigured for an entirely new proportion of volume. Um, so we could have kind of recalculated the model for a totally different space and reassembled it. Um, so that would be a potential of the project. Um, or um, in the way that these pieces are kind of mapped onto the net um, using the site-specific process, um, that same exact process, um, because it exists in our script, could be kind of re reconfigured for a totally different site. Um, so it has that potential. We haven't been able to do that yet, um, but it's able to because of the process that we have. We have one right here. Yeah, hello. Um, I was wondering, did you ever want to uh, add lighting to your like projects, like 3D lighting that kind of gives your um, project more life and like motion and stuff like that? It, it's something yeah. that we've absolutely thought about. Um, you know, with uh, Cumulus, I guess we lit it from outside, but I'm, I'm thinking you're meaning more internally lit. Um, it's something that we've thought about. It gets very expensive, and all of our projects are kind of operating on really tight budgets. Um, that's not to say that in the future we won't hopefully be able to explore that. The sun does a decent job. Yeah. <laughs> we rely on the natural light. Yeah. Yes. Here we go. Here? Right here. So um, it's beautiful, and um, it's something I'm really interested in because I, it, was it something I said? <laughs> 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 um, for a lot of reasons, because I'm in some work that I'm doing, I use a lot of materials that um, are, as opposed to picking the material, the material is picking me, so to speak. And so then I have to develop according to the material. There was a point at which, because I was struck at how genius you figured this out, like when you went to the weaving and created the bobbins for this specific thing, I, I, it was just brilliant how you managed that for this purpose. But then I started thinking, this is maybe more complicated than it needs to be. I mean, why not just, you know, whip it around and boom, put it up there. We definitely <laughs> had that thought. Pardon? We definitely, there were it's points really where we were, there were, there were points where we thought, oh, what are we gonna do? And we, we ended up simplifying certain aspects of it. Like the first image of the bobbins you saw had, I don't know what the ratio would be, but there were maybe close to twice as, we got rid of about half of the bobbins because we were doubling up uh, the fiber. So to get to your, to, just to get to that point about, is it too complicated? Um, well, it's precise. Pre I mean, maybe that's not the well, word. Precise, uh, but specifically the bobbin lace question. technique, because uh, as Lavender mentioned before, the carbon fiber really likes to intersect itself, and bobbin lace is um, is uh, a way that the, the carbon fiber is always kind of overlapping and, and creating friction with itself and strengthening it. So okay. it wouldn't be as strong if we just sort of, if I understand what you're saying, like just make the shape, put the nails in, and then just kind of weave it around, it just wouldn't be nearly as strong. I also, um, I think another, kind of another answer um, that I could give is that um, this, so this was, this process was designed for this site and for this project, um, but we're also thinking of it kind of as part of a continuum um, and its potential for future projects. Um, so there were, I think in a lot of ways it could have been simplified, and then there were a lot of things where I really wanted dis to discover what the potential of that was so that I could kind of use it in kind of more and more complex configurations later. So, so that was gonna be my next question, which was yeah. a little more personal. I yeah. have a, um, 
um, space that is wide open dining room and kitchen and very high ceilings. And I'm thinking, you know, this would be perfect too <laughs> for my ceiling. So you really could go into some commercial production with this mm -hmm. or sell it personally as, mm -hmm. you know, an art installation that some very wealthy, you know, art purchaser would buy for mm -hmm. their home. I'm not that, but, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. It's funny that you say that when we were, so if you noticed some of the images of us assembling are, are taken in a storage unit. So because we needed to bake the large panels, we needed a large oven. Tech Shop has a powder coating uh, area where they have the large oven. So lo for logistics sakes, we rented a storage unit next mm -hmm. to Tech Shop and that's where we did all this work. And, um, and um, so we were, when we were renting the, the storage unit, it was funny that the guy was like, well, how much, you know, what, what is all this worth? And I was just like, nothing. Like, it's not. <laughs> it <has> <laughs> it's trash. Like, if somebody opened it up, they'd be like, uh, nah. like, if it were on Storage Wars or whatever that show was, <laughs> they'd be like, oh, they, they didn't have a good deal. So it's a, I appreciate you <laughs> saying that it would have to be a wealthy person. I don't think it would have to be a wealthy person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can negotiate. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Please come back and visit it during its lifetime here over the next three months. And I hope it has an autumn, yeah. too. I mean, I think that would be really wonderful. And thank you so much to Lavender and Jason and Nathaniel for this work. Thank you for coming this morning. It was great to thank have you. Thank you. I'd just like to thank thank Jesse and Wasan, uh, Lisa, everybody here at CAM. It was a really great, really great experience. It couldn't have been any better from our end, so thank you. Right.